Good morning, sir. Thank you for being here. Just so you know, we've got Colonel John Spencer here. We've got our regular uh, our, our regular moderators who support the channel. We've got CJ, artillery officer, ranger, kind of a kind of a, I'm kind of jealous, uh, but great guy. And beyond soft, a known uh, known entity to to Colonel Spencer, and now myself, uh, super great guy. Does some super fun stuff off uh, now that he's retired and he has more. Uh, he has the birth in which to do so. Um, and uh, thank you all very much for being here. Um, we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're 75 plus days into the war and invasion. Um, and as you know, uh, we've got uh, great successes, uh, engineering, uh, officer, uh, recce, artillery, M777s, and uh, actually there weren't M777s that were involved in the pontoon bridge situation, mm. but we saw the entire BTG destroyed in, uh, in, a, in, a, in an hour and an afternoon, including the tug pushing those pontoon, uh, pontoons across. Shocking, I'm sure that's not something we really expect uh, from a military planner perspective. I, I worked at a divisional level, sir, so I'm not, on, not as high as yours, but uh, I, got, I have good essay into that. Um, and that's obviously very interesting to us. And we're looking at, we just had Roman um, Tench, uh, I forget his last name. Uh, he was on here. He was a, he's an, uh, uh, a recce commander in the 93rd uh, Brigade, Mechanized Infantry Brigade, that's parked just uh, in uh, Kharkiv Oblast. Uh, they are facing off uh, with, the, with the Russians along, the, along a built-in um, uh, defensive line. It looks rather hasty. He's sitting across the 55th um, Mechanized uh, Armored Brigade. Um, and uh, that's uh, he's abutted by the 25th and the 81st Assault Brigade uh, along that line. Um, there's been a wedge created by the Russians because they've been pushed on their right flank, mm. the Ukrainian left flank coming down from Kharkiv. And obviously they're trying to squeeze uh, Izium. Uh, as Mariupol uh, has only about two BTGs left uh, doing some isolation activity with the Azov cell plant, the rest of them have gone west and north uh, to support um, the existing Russian forces there. The biggest concentration of Russian forces are still right there in the Donbass. So um, aside from shenanigans uh, with amphibious silliness uh, near Odessa um, and, and regular rabble rousing in Transnistria and Moldova, uh, that's kind of the enemy disposition and uh, rough strengths. I just wanted to give that set rep so we all know what's what and who's who in the zoo. Um, and uh, wanted to kick it off to you. Uh, what, what do you think? Uh, what can you speak to the current assessment? What's your current assessment of the situation? Uh, there's a pretty much a static situation between uh, Ukrainian and Russian forces in Donbass. Uh, Ukrainians are being um, resupplied. Uh, those M777s are all uh, somewhere nice, except for one that was damaged in, in, trans, in, in the transportation. Uh, it's probably fixed now. And as we see Ukrainian capabilities increase, we see uh, Russian capabilities decrease. Um, any thoughts? Uh, dealer's choice, sir. Where would you like to start? Yeah, a couple of things. I guess starting at the, at the strategic, the uh, Finnish declaration that they will join NATO would be very shocking for many in Russia who have always seen Finland as a neutral party. Um, you know, if they do go into NATO, noting it will take some time, although they may speed it up. But remember, ascension to NATO takes the permission of all NATO members, so that could take up to a year. But if they are able to pull this off, um, NATO doubles its frontage um, against Russia, uh, land frontage, that is. That is really interesting. That is going to be very challenging for the Russians to accept intellectually. Um, but Finland is no longer this neutral state on their border. So, you know, we should watch. We've already seen Medvedev make some comments about it. There's been other commentary in the Russian press uh, that's pretty bellicose. Um, but, you know, this is 180 degrees from... Putin's intention when he started the war and what we're seeing is probably the greatest modern example of a strategic outcome being 180 degrees from what a national leader intended. So I think the strategic is very interesting to watch. Um, you know, there's obviously the new US package. Um, I think the Europeans, old, you know, Germany, uh, France and other countries, you know, should look at that and, and look at their own mega packages. Um, so that that is the strategic lay down for me at this point. Um, 
I think Donbass is interesting because I know you described it as static. Um, you know, it's still back and forth. I mean, both sides are in play. Both sides um, are able to throw punches at the moment. But the the most interesting areas for me is this Kharkiv counteroffensive, uh, mainly because uh, securing Kharkiv and getting it out of field artillery range doesn't get it out of long range missile range, but out of field artillery range is a significant humanitarian and political goal for the Zelensky government. Um, but it really places the Russians in a bit of a dilemma. I mean, what do they do about being pushed back over the border? Do they um, seek to fix the Ukrainians on the border there? Do they uh, seek to do something a little more aggressive? Um, But what do they do about the northern flank of their eastern offensive now? Um, You know, this old horns of a dilemma, it's an old meme, but it's, it's very true. The Russians are well and truly on that. The final piece for me, I keep looking to the south. I mean, Russia still has significant forces based in and out of Crimea um, and around Zafarista, uh, that's an area where they could really cause some trouble for the Ukrainians. Um, it hasn't been quiet around Kherson in the south, but it hasn't received the same attention. I keep uh, an eye on the south all the time because it kind of kind of worries me if I was a Ukrainian strategist. It's like, what are they thinking in the south and how much trouble could they cause for Ukraine in the south? Okay. No, I, I should have started on the operational level there, or like even the bigger picture. Um, so your opinion on uh, the Finns, uh, you haven't mentioned the Swedes. And uh, did you mention the uh, uh, touch on the UK's? What, what, is, what, is, what is the significance? If we want to go that high, let's let's talk about the significance of uh, Boris Johnson's commitment to Finland and Sweden. Uh, is it uh, pie in the sky or is it hyperbole? Like what kind of real commitment? Um, We're talking nuclear subs, Trident. Yeah, I mean, I I saw that. I mean, I kind of shrugged and went, well, we've we've seen that before and it ended up in World War II. So we need to be careful about those kind of commitments. Um, And Britain really doesn't have a lot of military capacity to do that. It's spent the last 20 years cutting its conventional forces. Um, You know, their army's the smallest it's been in, you know, know, more than a century. So it doesn't have a lot of capacity to do anything but um, throw choice words at the Russians and maybe a couple of battalions. Um, you know, important politically, um, particularly since Finland has actually said it wants to join NATO um, and is going to apply. Sweden's not quite there yet, even though it's telegraphing in that direction. Um Commitments to the defence of Finland, if that came from the United States or Germany, that would be really, really interesting and and groundbreaking. Um, But we haven't seen that yet other than, uh, you know, some some diplomatic talks and and niceties. Right. So when it comes to um, uh, the, 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 I think there was a Russian talking head who, had threatened uh, some kind of nuclear war against yeah. Finland. Uh, well, the, these these comments, I mean, they have to just be uh, extreme hyperbole. Uh, how can how can that even be sanctioned? Um, is it just more of more of the same? And from Russia, is w- what we've learned to expect from them. Um, Finland is a bit different. Um, you know, one it it is on Russia's border. It's a country Russia's fought a couple of wars against before. Um, And, you know, Finland is proximate to some pretty sensitive Russian military location, so it is slightly different. That doesn't mean they can do a lot about it. I mean, Ukraine is really taxing their military. Um, All they really have is their strategic capacity. Um, But, you know, using a nuclear weapon just because Finland signs a treaty with a different country uh, is is extreme overreaction. Uh, And the reality is... Uh, we've seen back and forth uh, since 1945 between superpowers, and it's never come to the exchange of nuclear weapons. Um, largely, countries with nuclear weapons have been very responsible. Uh, the Russians have been largely responsible, other than the little Cuban debacle. I, I think it's very unlikely that you'll see this. It- it's sabre rattling and not much more. Thank you for that. Um, when it comes to uh, the... Um... Uh, Colonel Vindman actually was was writing a foreign policy 
uh, review paper, and I had the, the honor of looking at it. I don't know if it's published yet, but it was pretty much uh, the nuts and bolts of, of the part of the conclusion was about um, uh, limiting limiting Russian defeat and mitigating uh, Ukrainian victory. He didn't say that, but I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing that. Um, the fears that the West has related to, yeah, if you want to jump on it, I think you know what I mean. Yeah, he, he did publish it. Just as that's all I oh, want to say. Yeah, it's out. Oh, he just published it already. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Did you? Uh, what do you think of that? I mean, uh, it, it, he's basically saying we're hi- the West hiding behind the, the West is committing in- incremental uh, donations of equipment, starting shorter range, medium, long, and obviously the idea is to not get to the point where the Russians are completely destroyed and humiliated, and and, and the risks of nuclear war are uh, are more. Um, uh, what do you think of that? Is it true? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the United States and NATO um, have some big choices, some important considerations here. Um, they've obviously shifted their strategic outcomes for this war um, to the degradation of Russia's military capacity and ability to threaten its neighbours. Uh, that is very different from where we're at on the 24th or even the 25th, 26th of February. Uh, But, you know, I've written about this recently, is there's a right way and a wrong way to defeat a country. And there are good historical uh, case studies of this from the 20th century, uh, where if you defeat someone uh, and then give them a hand afterwards uh, without humiliation, uh, that is not a bad way to defeat somebody. You still want to defeat them and you want to defeat them quickly. But if they're defeated, they're humiliated, they're not being helped, they're broken, uh, they're desperate, that's actually in some respects a more dangerous Russia uh, than what we've faced before. I don't think that's in anyone's interest. So, yes, let's go all out, help the Ukrainians win quick and defeat Russia, but we can't afford a bitter, disenfranchised um you know, the whole world's against us, anti-Nazi uh, narrative coming out of that country, uh, remembering the huge amounts of nuclear weapons and potentially chemical and biological weapons it's retained. Right. So post, post-Versailles Germany and pre-Versailles Germany didn't have nuclear weapons uh, and they didn't have that power and also didn't have the same regime. So the problem is that one of the, one of the key fact, key key factors in that in, in that equation would, ha- would have to be a regime change ostensibly um, and we're not guaranteed that even with a Russian defeat so um, I think there are people pointed to um, a recent example um, uh, Yom Kippur War 73 war uh, the the um, the uh, American and and, and otherwise uh, and the Soviet pressure on Israel after it crossed the canal and encircled the third Egyptian army. Mm-hmm. And they and they said outright, look, uh, if that if they go, Sadat goes, and it's going to be a regular crap show, um, and you need to stop. And they did. And I think the, some people pointed out that they feel the Ukrainians are going to be told the same thing. They're going to get to Donbass. They're going to trick the enemy. They'll they'll have enough of the the new weapons and motivation uh, and the armor uh, and their counter counter battery. Uh, and they're gonna they're gonna take the Donbass, and then that'll that'll be a trigger for something worse from Russia. Would it, any any insight on that? Um, possibly. Um, you know, I think if Putin was clever, at some point in the next week, he'd um, you know say, "Hold fast, we won," and um, you know he could craft a narrative around that quite you know reasonably. I think, from a Russian perspective, given the amount of ground they've taken, that would be the smart play, and he could declare a victory. Um, whether he's going to do that or not, I'm not sure. If if the Ukrainians do take um, a lot of ground back from the Russians, um, you know, once again, this is a political discussion that Zelensky has to make some big decisions on, on how far can I push Putin before he does make irrational decisions. I mean, I don't think Putin at the moment is totally irrational. I mean, there's, is, there's a rationality, but from a very different perspective from what you and I would see. So this is a political, not a military decision. Uh, Zelensky needs to really carefully balance how much they push them back versus not cross, crossing a Russian red line. Now, that would 
make Russia a pariah for the next century if they were to do something like that. I'm pretty sure even the Russians don't want that. Um, so this is a really careful political decision. It's not a military one. It is all political. Uh, the worst thing that can happen is uh, some countries in Europe who believe they can tell the Ukrainians what their theory of victory should be. I think that is morally problematic uh, given they don't have skin in the game. I think the US policy is the right one where the US have said we think the Ukrainian theory of victory is the one the Ukrainians come up with, not the one they're forced into by uh, some European actors. So but in the first first two, three weeks of this war, many people said if um, if this all went back to the 23rd of February, that would be a victory for Ukraine and Zelensky could tolerate it and accept it politically. Now the calculus has obviously changed. Where do you see a possible victory? What does a possible victory look like for you? Well, I think in the first couple of weeks, we weren't talking about a Ukrainian victory. We were talking about, you know, equipping a Ukrainian resistance. Um, so that conversation has slowly evolved over the last, you know, six weeks or so where it's become clear the Ukrainians have a chance of actually beating the Russians here. Um, and I think that is is the case. Certainly returning to 24 February positions, um, that would be a Ukrainian victory, a, a significant Ukrainian victory. But once again, um, these aren't mil uh, military decisions. This is something Zelensky has to carefully calibrate, you know, um, if he was able to take back all land lost since 24 February and receive assurances about an international referendum in Donbass and Crimea, that would be uh, a significant outcome. Because I think despite, you know, what happened with the Minsk um, Accords, you're actually going to see a far more interested Europe and the United States in the future of Ukraine compared to 2014, 2015. So just lastly, before we go to some of the questions here, so I, I you know, being former policy wonk at foreign affairs, um, I pretty much always preach that getting back to the lines from the day before the war is a massive victory mm -hmm. and that Zelensky would be forced to sue for peace. You know, you get peace through victory or victory through peace. I think it's the other way around. I think that having um, maintaining the line and having some form of referendum on the Donbass and then Crimea would probably be the most tenable solution for him politically. However, as we've said, the calculus has changed on the ground. I'm not sure his own people will go for that. Um, and that's, yeah. that's the whole point. Yeah, no, I think that's a very reasonable point. I mean, they've got their backs up. Uh, they have been successful. They've carried this war by themselves. Yes, they've received a lot of external aid, but not a single Westerner has gone in and fight under their own flag. Um, so, you know, um, you know, didn't Klaesvitz talk about the people as part of this trinity and, and the emotions and the anger and these kind of things? Uh, Busha and the torture, the rape of Ukrainian civilians all plays into this as well. So, you know, I, I expect there will be greater demands from the Ukrainian people, uh, but that's not for us to expectation manage. This is something the president of Ukraine has to do with his own government and his own people. It can't be something that's forced upon the Ukrainian people from outside. Fair enough. Okay, great. So having said that, thank you for that. And if there's any follow-up you want, uh, please feel free to take that time, sir. If not, we're going to go to Colonel Spencer. Um, John? Yeah, I actually just, you, Yehuda, you basically said it. I mean, you know, two, I agree with General Ryan that 2014, 2015 was a different state. Ukrainian is already a different nation. Its people are different. Zelensky has said he'll take any political no negotiation to the people, and they'll they'll have to, the parliament and the people will have to agree to the, to the decision. I don't know if even returning to the 24 February lines, this moment is acceptable, and that you know those agreements. Ukraine was in a different position, and arguably in a position of weakness, and um, they're clearly not in a position of weakness at the moment. There's still a lot of fighting to be had. You know, I, you know, I question too what winning looks like. It is, of course, a political settlement, um, but they're 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 coming to the political table in a in a massive position of strength they've never had before and, and that really complicates Putin's position with his ultimate goal of staying in power um, let alone the you know all nations primary strategic objective is is survival uh, nobody's threatening Russian country survival 
now if nuclear weapons are, are used in any any shape or form, then that that's changing. But um, the calculus is it's so complicated because Putin, we all know that Putin needs a solution, even if he wanted one. But Ukraine's in a position of power that. Sorry, you're getting cut off there, uh, John. I'm not sure if I can still hear you, but uh, CJ, do you have a question? I don't want to cut off Carl Spencer if he wants to, to finish anything there. I think he needs to reconnect. I'm not sure. John, either. Yeah, he's had for connection problems all uh, all day. So let's go, CJ and Murad. Go ahead. Hey, sir. I'm uh, CJ. I'm a fires officer in the U.S. Army. Get a quick question about your background with strategic planning, especially as we talk about, you know, op plans, con plans, and all that types of thing. I guess as someone who was sitting on the tarmac last summer in Afghanistan and told the country has two years until it uh, falls apart, you know, I don't, I don't really listen too much to that kind of strategic intelligence always. But I guess from your point of view, why do you think there was such a disconnect in between yeah, Russians' performance and the Ukraine's performance in this war? I, I'm pretty familiar with what they got wrong. I'm just more curious on, as to why. And how, as military officers, we can sort of plan and think about these things uh, better? Um, I think there's a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is, you know, both sides in war have agency, right? Um, and I think in some respect we forgot that both sides get a vote on the two-way firing range. Um, and because of that and because they're each trying to adapt, to learn, to outthink, to surprise each other, um, surprises happen. Um, so I think that's part of it. Part of it's just this is the nature of war, right? It's unpredictable. Um, and we should kind of give ourselves a little bit of a break that we didn't quite get it right, particularly in democracies, right? We always get the next war wrong. Um, but I think, you know, there has probably been some um, uh, uh, analytical effort that has overdrunk the Russian Kool-Aid. I mean, I, you know, I wrote about the Russian concepts in, in my book, um, you know, we've all kind of looked at, uh, you know, whether it's active defence or reflexive control or a range of different Russian ideas, even going way back to, you know, operational art and going, well, you know, there's some interesting ideas here. But the Russians weren't able to pull it off. Um, and the whole transformation project over the last 10 years uh, will be an interesting case study for all of us because all our militaries are trying to transform for the challenges of the 21st century, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. It's like, well, how they did it is important to study, what they did, what they told their government, what they did with their resources, well beyond just corrupt conduct. So I think there's some lessons there. Um, I, you know, I've seen there has been some back and forth between different analysts um, and academics uh, almost baiting each other sometimes on some of the analytical problems with this war. Uh, I find that unproductive and not something I'm interested in engaging in at all. I find it quite unedifying uh, because some of it's been nasty and unnecessary. So I think we need to give ourselves a break. You know, war is full of uncertainties. Uh, this one has just demonstrated that. No, thank you, sir. And as someone who, as a cadet who was at the Modern War Institute when it was first stood up, uh, I just, this is such an important question. I really thank you for your devotion to this cause. No worries. So and thanks to the Modern War Institute. I was an associate scholar there for a year at one point. Amazing. So, uh, by the way, just some housekeeping. If you could go ahead and check out uh, General Ryan's uh, Twitter uh, feed there, uh, some really important information for um, the for the expert and the layperson who's curious. Uh, he's also an, a renowned author and, and speaker. So uh, please, if you could go ahead and, uh, and uh, check his fo Twitter following out there, we'd really appreciate it. He comes here uh, and, and graces us with his um, pearls of wisdom. We do appreciate it, sir. We're going to go to M. Murat, uh, calling from Cairo, a uh, military type of source, and he'd like, uh, he'd like to ask you a question. Go ahead. Well, good morning, sir. Uh, good morning. Um, more on the tactical level, what is the most innovative tactic or the most innovative uh, piece of uh, addition to a piece of equipment that you've seen fielded by the Ukrainians right now? Um, well, I'd, I'd caveat my answer with saying probably none of us are seeing the whole picture in Ukraine. Um, and there's a lot of stuff we won't find out about until 
um, the, the end of, of the war. I think the real innovation isn't so much equipment, it's ideas, and it's this idea of, you know, soldiers, citizens transmitting information live on, uh, you know, the internet because they've been able to keep their internet and ter- ter- terrestrial communications going and influence large parts, not all, but large parts of the world to provide massive amounts of humanitarian, economic and military aid. I mean, you know, I, I look at the equipment that's being used. There's nothing really new that I'm seeing there. Uh, you know, loitering munitions aren't new. I mean, they've been around for a while either as um, systems of themselves or just, you know, bombs hovering over, aircraft hovering over the air, uh, battlefield in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's not a new concept. Um, I just think how the Ukrainians have leveraged information at every single level, including sending texts to Russian tank commanders saying, hey, if you surrender your tank, we'll give you 10000 Um I, I just think they've leveraged information in a more integrated and more innovative way than what we've seen before. Okay, uh, great. We're going to go ahead. Uh, John, Colonel Spencer, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, sir, so I, I caught the, the, the last bit about um, CJ, your modern wars to in the house. Uh, CJ's question. I, I, I agree with you, and that we've had a lot of questions about how we got it wrong going into this war. Whether you're in the Office of Net Assessments in the Pentagon or, or whatever equivalent organization that did Russian doctrine, Russian you know, war gaming, all of this, I agree with you that that I think those some of those discussions are you know, moot at this point. But I do struggle with what we see in the day to day analysis. Of course, I follow you and you're spot on every you know, your daily your assessments daily, if not uh, you more than a few days. But I I still see people on you know, whether it's television or in articles that were viewed as experts who I think their expertise, whether it's all the way up to the, you know, some of the, the giants like Mearsheimer or you know, this general, no offense, sir, this general, that general making predictions on a map today saying, okay, the, the Russians are going to take all the way from the Dnipro over. and There's nothing the Ukrainians can do about. I mean, I do there, I think there has to be a real time assessment of somebody's, um, studentness, you know, the scholarship in war expertise. So having said that, um, I, I trust your assessment and what, so what is your assessment as, as I know I could just read your feed, but for the group of operations today, let's just say the, some of the competitive advantages of both sides. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, I don't disagree on some of the analysis, if you could call it that, from people we thought might be experts. I mean, there's been some real junk out there, to be quite frank. Um, you know, I saw a, a retired general in the last 24 hours say that um, you, the war in Ukraine was the most stunning transformation in war in the last 150 years. I mean, what garbage. I mean, what absolute yeah, I agree. garbage. You know, what nuclear... Yeah. Weapons weren't transformational. Aircraft weren't transformational. Radio. I mean, just I look at this and go, you have not spent your time wisely in uniform to actually study the profession and its history. Um, Amen. So, you know, and there has been a lot of people in and out of uniform that you could potentially throw that accusation at. And there's a lot of people who were experts in Afghanistan last year who all of a sudden are experts uh, in Ukraine. Now, The way I come at it is I'm not an expert in Ukraine, but I've studied war for 35 years and you can apply that knowledge and its future trends to just about any conflict. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I I do agree with John. that Not so much that there's a need for reckoning, but there is a need for us to look at our analytical tools. You know, I certainly proposed a bunch of measures of effectiveness, tactical, operational and strategic in my book. You know, I'm going to re-look at those, do a reassessment of them and say how useful would they have been in looking at the Russians and Ukrainians in the wake of this war. So, you know, I, I think John makes a really good point there that without making it personal, we do need to look at our assessments, both classified and open, and make sure we're better at forming, informing our people 
and informing uh, our governments and our allies as, as we move forward. Um, one group I will call out, though, is the US intelligence community. I reckon what they've done in this war has been really interesting, particularly in some of its preemption before the war and now uh, highlighting potential false flag. This has been a slightly different use of strategic intelligence from what we're used to. Uh, I actually think it's been a quite interesting innovation and the US intelligence community deserves some kudos for how they've performed over the last six months. Agreed. That's come up a few times. Actually, when it comes to also the equipment, uh, um, actually, we'll go, we'll, well, I'll park that. I'm going to go to Beyond uh, Sof. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd love to give uh, the the IC a little bit of kudos, too, if it hadn't started in 2014. But that's, you know, um, that's a separate topic. No, the, the, I, I love what was being talked about tonight. I just want to, like, consider a couple different things with regards to, um, one, John, that was, that was amazing, some of the topic you were talking about with regards to, um, you know, preparatory. Um, hey there. Uh, I think we look. No, he dropped off right bang in the middle of the sentence. I apologize. Let me try to get him back up. Yeah, excellent. Okay, well, I'll go to the next question there that I had for you, sir. Um, the the in particular, uh, the ability of Ukrainians to take on board uh, new and unfamiliar equipment. Uh, a lot of a lot of us, as well as John was saying, Colonel Spencer was saying that um, you know it's pie in the sky. Some of these lists, which I saw through foreign affairs types, uh, was everything in the kitchen sink things that we don't even have enough of in our own country, let alone you know, have them train on. Uh, and then <clears throat> we've seen them employ certain things they haven't used. Uh, and a lot of people, again, pointed to use the Israeli example, uh, using when, when, you're, when, you're, when you have an existential threat, um, you can take on things and learn how to use them pretty quickly um, if you're motivated and intelligent enough. Is there, is there anything to that? Does that, does that is, there, is there a threshold? Is there a red line? I mean, does it mean you can give them F-35s and have them you know, learn how to use them? That's just one strange example. But um, where do you think that ends? Where does it start? Yeah, pretty interesting, interesting question. I mean, I, clearly there's some things they might ask for. You go, well, we're not giving you that. You know, it might be, you know, tactical nuclear weapons or, or you know, things like that. Um, you know, aid providers have to make an assessment, not just of their ability to provide something, but you know, how effective do they think it might be? Um, whilst there's been some interesting asks from the Ukrainians, I think the president has been pretty consistent in the kinds of things he's asked for. You know, he's been asking for the basics, you know, more tanks, you know, artillery, ammunition and things like that. Um, so, you know, there is a you have to go through a process when someone asks for these things to make sure it's realistic, it's affordable and has some chance of actually making a difference. Um, it's always hard when you're not the one with skin in the game to do that, but I think it is a necessary part of the provision of aid. Okay. So I've seen on a list, I've seen on a list as many Leopard 2s as you can give. I've literally seen that and I kind of laughed. So, well, they're a good recon tank, but they're not a main battle tank. Oh, sorry, Leopard 2. Sorry, I thought you meant Leopard 1. Um, yeah, Leopard 2. I mean, pretty complex tank. Uh, very, very highly engineered. Um, yeah, good tank, but... Uh, is is 100, 200 of them going to make a difference to people who have never driven one? Yeah, well, I don't know. Uh, I, I've, I've never operated one, but I certainly operated in ones. Um, the, they're difficult to train people to, you know, drive and crew, but they're even more difficult to train with the tactics. If they've got the tactics, you've got to say, well, yeah, let's give them, let's give them some and, and see how they go. The problem obviously is always the support stuff. And, you know, shout out to Trent Talenko here and his magnificent logistics, uh, threads. Um, you know, he'll be the first one rightly to say, well, you could give them to them, but boy, can they support them? And I know, you know, having ambled around in M1s, those frigging things break down all the time, no matter how well they're maintained. 
Oh, 100%. All right, well, also we have a new guest of the panel, uh, not new to the room, is Major Jason Sheru. He's a full disclosure, former directing staff of mine at the Tactics School, a center of excellence at CFP Gagetown, where dreams go to die. Uh, Major Sheru, <laughs> welcome to the panel. <laughs> well, <laughs> someone asked me when I come back from Gagetown, how was it? What's Gagetown like? I say, Imagine all the bad parts of the Bible put together, and that's Gage Town. Uh, we've got him here there, sir, and I uh, just want to introduce you. And he's also um, a partner in crime with Colonel John Spencer on urban warfare things. He's actually the world's leading historian on Ortona and all sorts of other cool stuff. Um, and I won't uh, belabor that. Let's go to CJ. He's got a question for you, sir. Yes, sir. So in this, you know, I've been a part of the space for 75 days now, and um, you know, we talk a lot about intelligence, maneuver, uh, fires, but one Hello. thing uh, based on. Oh, can you hear me? So sometimes uh, certain speakers cannot hear other speakers. In such case, there is a trick that we can do on the top right of your screen next to the arrow. There are three buttons. If you press those, uh, the subtitles can be turned on. It's a Twitter glitch. Unfortunately, it's an. Uh, we're still beta testers for Twitter, but. Uh, that well, let's try and see if he can hear. So, General Ryan, I can you hear us? I certainly can hear you. No worries at all. CJ, can you speak, please, and see if oh. he can hear you? Radio check. Hey, with Charlie. No, uh, uh, General Ryan can't hear him. I don't no, think. I can't hear him. I can, see, down, uh, uh, see, I can see the that subtitles, that yeah. but that's about it. <laughs> We're going to get CJ to pop down. He's going to leave the room uh, by clicking the leave uh, red leave button and then he's going to pop back close the app and pop back in that's the that's the way to resolve that over to you colonel spencer so sir since you're so you're diverse in your study of warfare i have two questions and and i know it's not right as the the question person to come up with two but give you the choice of which one you want to answer one we've had a lot of conversations in the space about the russian btg as the unit of action the unit that we all talk about um, your thoughts on the force structure of you, the, the Russian military using the BTG pros and cons, or if you like, sir, um, China's strategic thinking uh, up to this point of what's going on in Ukraine? Um, I'll, I'll tackle both, but I'll go to the BTG piece first. There has been an infatuation with BTG counting. Um, and I'm not sure whether it's a useful analytical tool. It's It's almost like the 21st century version of body count, and we all know how that ended up. Um, you know, BTGs are actually built out of Russian brigades, right? You know, Russian brigades are tasked with uh, building, you know, minimum are two BTGs, some commands three. Um, I always think a combined arms brigade is the right unit of action to follow because it has... Firstly, because it has all the different elements of a modern fighting force, you know, be they, uh, you know, artillery, uh, armour, infantry, engineers, logistics, communications, EW, that you can group and regroup in different ways. Um, So a focus on BTGs I think removes flexibility from a brigade commander because I don't know how well you can regroup between BTGs and the rest of the brigade. You know, when I was a brigade commander... Uh, not only would you battle group all the time, but you'd focus on quickly regrouping between different elements of the brigade depending on the mission. So I think BTGs takes away some of that uh, flexibility. Uh, But, you know, as a combined arms concept, it was certainly worth looking at. But I've always uh, been a fan of, you know, infantry battalions, armour battalions, engineer battalions, uh, train in their basics, be excellent at their core skills, and then train in the regrouping grouping and regrouping as a subsequent activity. Don't group them to start off with. Um, So China, well, so much here at every single level. You know, I've written some stuff on what President Xi might take away from this. I mean, he's got some issues. I mean, firstly, he'd be embarrassed to be so closely linked to a loser, um, which Putin clearly is in this war. Um, But also I think this war has really impacted on Xi's favourite narrative about the decline of the West, certainly since 2008 and the GFC. That has been a a favoured meme, let's call it, from President Xi and his uh, his close associates. 
So it's been difficult for the Chinese that way. Um, economically, you know, they've got some decisions to make. Uh, they've been buying Russian oil, but do they support Russia more so they don't lose? You know, is Russia losing against China's strategic interests? So, you know, my sense is this is really torturing them about do we upset the Americans and pay economically or do we support the Russians? So this decline of the West narrative at least survives into the future. So they, I think they're the big political ones for China. Um, operationally, their big operational problem is clearly Taiwan. Um, and from this, they will have taken a couple of things. They will have seen how long it took the West to actually start providing aid. You know, we, we're all congratulating ourselves now. But, hey, this didn't start on day one, did it? The first few days, the West was looking at going, well, sucks to be you, Ukraine, but we'll arm you when you're, you're taken over by the Russians and we'll make sure your resistance is kitted out. It probably took, you know, 72 hours to a week for the West to go, actually, we might provide you with aid. So the, Rus- the Chinese will see that as an opportunity and go, well, if we're going to take Taiwan, we're going to take it really quick before any kind of aid can get in, before the Americans can intervene. Um, and we've got to kill their president and the government straight away. We don't want them being this shining exemplar of democracy around the world that Zelensky has become. So I think, you know, they're just some of the lessons I think the Chinese might take from this. Um, I, my sense is that this might bring forward the Chinese timeline, not push back. I've always thought, you know, tw- before 2030, Taiwan is going to be in play. Um, you know, I don't think it's the next eight years anymore. It could be the next three to five years, but it is definitely going to be in play this decade. So, uh, thank you for that. So, you know, just while we're on the topic uh, of your backyard, um, and it's something that's come up before, uh, a lot of a lot of people have, uh, have 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 speculated that the calculus that China employs vis-a-vis Taiwan has to change naturally because of their fear of the very um, very uh, vocal and hearty response from the West. Mm. Does that put um, Does that put Australia in a, a far more unique position and role as the uh, uh, as a linchpin, as a go-to nation uh, for for Western democracies, uh, or does that just put unnecessary pressure on Australia? Is is it gladly taken? Do you have the resources, the political will? Um, because it looks like things are going to shift there eventually, right? Oh, I mean, you know, the Chinese have been working this problem for decades. You know, they did their first assessment of an invasion of Taiwan in nineteen forty nine. So, you know, this is a problem they've been working on for a very long time. I don't think. Ukraine has changed that ultimate objective. Uh, it might have modified their calculus, but frankly, the CCP do not care what the rest of the world think when it comes to Taiwan. They've been very clear. The president has been very clear in his speeches on this topic. They are going to take back Taiwan one way or the other. So, you know, uh, I think there over the last few decades been quite a bit of wishful thinking about China. We thought if we uh, let them accede to the World Trade Organization. They they modernise, they grow their economy, and democracy would naturally flow. That is and has been proven to be a flawed idea. Um, so anyone who engages in wishful thinking that the Chinese may think Taiwan's too hard in the wake of Ukraine really uh, isn't thinking this through. The Chinese are going to take back Taiwan. They've been very direct in this, and all of us have a role to play in both a deterrence framework and a response framework if that happens 100 percent. all right we've got thomas thomas is actually out living in japan he's a polyglot bunch of languages and uh, comes in to give us a lot of updates go ahead thomas good morning sir thank you for your time for this space um i was going to say that uh major spencer magically asked the exact question that i had for you so i was going to take down my hand thank you so much for that comprehensive coverage of China. Uh, maybe I can add one interesting thing that came up. The conservative daily uh, News here yesterday reported that the former Chinese ambassador to the Ukraine put Thomas, an just, just on. Yeah, Thomas, it's very hard. Uh, can you get your mic closer to your mouth? Uh, because you're really kind of silent. Try again? Yeah. What I'll do is uh, form, I'll format another mic and com- come back oh, to it This later. is way better. You're perfect. You're perfect. Oh, okay. Gee, sorry for the 
the dropout on that. Thank you so much um, for the dealing with China. That was really my question. So, but I wanted to add that the conservative daily Sanke here in Tokyo uh, ran with a story yesterday that recently the former ambassador of China to the Ukraine, of all people, 75 year old gentleman, put up an article stating essentially it's only a matter of time that Russia is defeated. Hmm. And it was on for a, it was on for a while, <laughs> and then the uh, the CC the CCP uh, pulled the lever on it yeah. and got it off. They got hmm. it off. So it was kind of an interesting thing. So you've, you've discussed China, but I was going to say, can you maybe apply something similarly to North Korea? Uh, they're a nation that learned their parades uh, from Stalin, and uh, they've got a shiny surface to them. But under the surface, we wonder, you know, if push comes to shove, what, what's going to happen there? And they certainly have been watching this with respect to Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much, sir. That's the question. Yeah, I think both the Chinese and North Koreans would say a big lesson for them is if you've got nuclear weapons, people aren't willing to use the full force of their militaries against you when there's possibly, probably something to that. Um, you know, people have been predicting the end of the North Korean regime since 1953, um, and we all know how that's turned out. They always seem to struggle through. Um, I, I look at North Korea a bit differently. Um, I look at North Korea as an example of what I don't want Russia, a defeated Russia to become. I think that would be very, very dangerous to, for international security. Um, so, you know, China, sorry, North Korea should be the exemplar we hold up uh, when we say we want to see Russia defeated in this invasion, but we don't want them to become North Korea. How do we kind of square that, that kind of challenge? Fair enough. I mean, and 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 to that, and to add to that point, Russia still has uh, thirty years of its people living in almost like a faux democracy and a faux open society. So I think it'd be a lot harder to switch Russia into that uh, frame of mind because their people have already had a taste of what's out there, as opposed to the North Koreans. So that might, I think, it ties back to the other question we had, the other comment that we made or you made, sir, about um, you know. Would there be a regime change in order to have that post-Versailles Russia? Mm. Wouldn't there have to be a regime change? I mean, isn't that really the crux of it? Um, not necessarily. Uh, certainly Germany had a regime change at the end of the Second World War. But remember, um, the Americans kept the Japanese emperor on. So there's examples of both. Now, I'm not suggesting Putin and the Japanese emperor are the same, you know, um, but, you know, the, the Japanese emperor during the Second World War was part of decision-making. It wasn't apart from a lot of the war-making decisions, but the Americans kept him on for cultural reasons. I'm not suggesting we should yeah. keep on Putin. Um, I'm just saying we need to be imaginative if we're going to end this war in a way that Russia is not a, th a threat uh, immediately or in the long term to uh, European or, or, or global security. I don't think you're going to see the overthrow of Putin anytime soon. He's had 20 years to solidify his position. Um, and, you know, these oligarchs, okay, they might have lost a bit of money, but say they lost $2 billion out of a $100 billion or $50 billion fortune. Um, I don't think that's enough to convince them to support some overthrow of Putin. Um yeah, so I think there's a lot of glib statements about that. Oh, we just need to overthrow Putin and the war will be over. I, I just, you know, if it was that simple, it probably would have already happened. I, I think we need to be more creative in our thinking about geopolitics uh, on this particular issue. Well, the, the only problem that a lot of people would point to is that after Bucha and the Erpin and Hostomo and the other undiscovered graves and, and wells with bodies in it, that... that Lavrov and Putin will will forever be persona non grata on the yeah, world stage, and correct. that's the fear I think a lot of politicians yeah, no, have. Absolutely, I, absolutely. I don't disagree with that. That's why I'm saying this is hard. I mean, um, you know, the Russians don't appear to be keen to get rid of Putin at the moment. I mean, the support for the war um, is reasonably high still in Russia, notwithstanding the losses they're taking. The feed of information the Russians get is very different to us. Uh, I'm not saying. I don't think Putin should go. Of course he should go. You know, I want to see him gone like everyone else. But we have to be pragmatic here about what's reasonably achievable to end this war in a way that Ukraine retains its sovereignty, but Russia doesn't become a more dangerous actor uh, in the global environment. And like I said, it, 
this isn't simple. <laughs> and it takes some really creative thinking from lots of people from lots of different countries to look at how might we do this. Now, clearly, Ukraine winning is part of that, but it's it's way more than that. And, um, you know, I, I don't have a solution, frankly, but I know we need to think very creatively beyond let's just get rid of Putin as, as attractive and as uh, emotionally satisfying as that might be. Thank you. Uh, just a quick notice to our audience. Uh, if you could share and retweet the space, it would help greatly. And uh, again, please do tag our guests and uh, General McRyan. And just slam the button on the bottom right of your screen, the blue one with a plus sign, share and retweet. And back to you, Yehuda. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, no, I guess uh, I guess that's the $64,000 question. What do we do? What is what is it? What does Ukraine do with a defeated Russia? Um, here, here, here's a broad one. Is there and there, is there any circumstance that only involves Ukrainian forces that you think might lead to some form of escalation, a la chemical or nuclear weapons? I mean, if if Ukrainians were to take the Donbass, take Crimea, do you think that would be? Are these red lines in your opinion for Russia? I think Crimea. Uh quite possibly would be. I mean, Crimea isn't just territory. It's a significant military base for the Russians on on the Black Sea. Um, I think you would have to be very careful in looking at what uh, Ukraine might like to do with Crimea. It doesn't mean it shouldn't go back to them eventually. I think it should. Uh, But how they do that uh, may not be through military means. Donbass... um, you know, potentially they could take back that back, particularly if they are able to, um, you know, change uh, some views in the DNR and, and other uh, proxies in that region. Now, the fact that they've been fighting alongside the Russians indicates that's probably unlikely. But I think Crimea is definitely um, a Russian red line. Donbass, I'm not sure. And this is why, you know, I keep talking, this is a political calculation by Zelensky. It's not a military consideration. And he has a constant balancing act about how far can he push the Russians to satisfy his own people without pushing the Russians or or doing something that might result in the Russians using a weapon of mass destruction. Fair enough. No, thank you. Uh, Nick Brown has a question for you, sir. Uh, Hi, General. Would you, would you, is it fair to summarise your position as saying that we should not attempt to humiliate Putin? Oh, and that's in reference to President Macron, I think you know? Yeah. Um, We should make sure a defeated Russia is not humiliated. Um, I think that's the priority here. It's not... Obviously, Putin is part of the calculus when it comes to Russia. Um, But I think it's more about um, this sense... You know, Germany had this sense of stab in the back at the end of the First World War... Um, we want to make sure that a defeated Russia is one we can still work with, and one that doesn't take its side outside, take itself out of international uh, interactions and uh, mechanisms for things like nuclear arms control and, and these kind of things. So, for me, the humiliation piece is don't humiliate the nation. Um, Putin, I can take or leave, um, but. There's a right way, and as I've said, you know, there's there's kind of a right way and a wrong way to defeat Russia. The hard bit is finding exactly where that line exists. I I I, I sort of was using uh, Putin and Russia as synonyms, and and you're right. Of course, there are there are differences between them. Although, if Putin was replaced tomorrow, it'd be interesting to see whether he would be replaced by somebody uh, less bad or even worse. Well, and that's the real challenge, right? You know, no one talks about, well, what if what, Putin goes and we get something worse? I mean, you, mm. you've got to have these conversations. You can't just have the single level, let's get rid of Putin, or if Putin goes, the war's over. Well, not so much. So, um, you know, I think what you've just said is a far more sophisticated way of looking at it um, than some of the commentators I've seen, you know, in the press go, well, you know, just need to get rid of Putin and, um, you know, Ukraine will be good to go. I, I just, it's just not that simple. Agreed, I've, yeah. heard it, um, I've heard it suggested that Navalny is pro-Russian Crimea. 
for example. So, yeah, so there you go. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's true, but it, you know, it doesn't sound implausible. You know, yeah, the, 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 he the said so. Russian imperialist essentially, and his background is in neo-Nazi movements in Russia. So keep that in mind. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Sure. Yeah, he's uh, definitely not. Uh, he's not. He's not the darling of the West. If the West knew what he was about, mm. um, I weren't. Axel had his hand up, and then uh, and then M. Yeah, just I wanted to reel back to one point because uh, I've been speaking to my Finnish friends uh, here in the region. We've seen that the uh, Welsh have come up uh, on their NATO maneuvers, and that it seems that the commitment of Britain is actually quite significant. Yes, mm-hmm. they may have more choice words to throw, but still, if I'm not quite wrong, they are getting the 16 AA here, which would, even with an initial commitment anywhere between 3,200, 3,500, that's quite sincere a number. So what you said, I, I really appreciate that, that as Finland now extends or quite literally doubles the front line for the Russians, whilst they're already extended with such a significant force commitment by a NATO member, notably the NATO member which has been supporting Ukraine from the very beginning, that is a good signalling, even if Britain cannot defend Finland or the NATO in the north alone. Mm. I just wanted to highlight that because I thought it's quite, I mean, for you as a member of the Commonwealth, uh, I think it's quite a a commitment that your brothers in arms are doing this. Mm. Um, What brings me to the other question is that with such commitments in place, the Russians do not have the capacity to actually... Um, be a real threat to Ukraine if Ukraine manages to push them out. Because how would they rebuild under sanctions? How would they rebuild in the scenario you just laid out? You said also, and sorry to frame the question that long, but you said also that you look at North Korea and with all uh, the impact of them suffering through for such a long time, when I look at North Korea, I see South Korea. And I see South Korea as the one nation which actually excelled under the protection of the United States. And many troops were mandated amongst them under the UN mandate, initially Australians. So maybe we just have to be ready to not humiliate, but contain, which is the much harder job. How do you see NATO being able to help in the deterrence element of containment with Ukraine after the war? Um, well, I think you're going to see a, a changed security architecture in Europe um, once this war is over, if indeed it does end. Um, you know, you've seen the rise in influence of the Visegrad Four. You will see potentially, not assured, but an expansion of NATO with Finland and Sweden, depending on all other NATO members acceding to that. Um and I think that's a really good thing. I think uh, Europe really leaning forward um, to do that's a good thing. You know, certainly uh, for those of us in the Indo Pacific, it's a good thing because we need the Americans focused on the main game, which is China. Um, so, you know, what that will eventually look like, where the UK sits in that, where Germany and France sit in that, where the Eastern Europeans sit in that, where the Nordic countries sit in that because they all have slightly different perceptions of what European security is, um, will be really interesting. Now, whether it's containment, um, that may not be the best uh, description for what they're going to try and do with Russia, Uh, but it it will be, I think, a very different security architecture in Europe in the wake of of this war. It's certainly woken a lot of people up, not just about the about military threats, but you know, basic threats to democ- democratic countries. Now, are they worth? Is it worth fighting for when you live in a democracy? Well, as we've seen in the past, absolutely, because the alternative's pretty grim. Um, so, you know, I, I I would be thinking about what does this revised European security architecture look like? What does NATO look like? What does EU and its role have in European security after the war? Um, there are people talking about these, but there's a long way to go to come up with some kind of definitive answer. Would you allow me to add one more wargaming question? Sure. If you were, as you said uh, last time you were on the space, uh, sometimes it's great to be fly on the wall and see what the Ukrainian uh, armed force mm. and high command is doing, but put yourself in their shoes. 
if you were now looking at the south, Kriviri, Kherson, and Crimea, how would you take Crimea? Uh, I think Crimea is potentially a bridge too far at the moment. Um, I think you would probably want to isolate it uh, before you start thinking about taking it. I mean, this this is this is very different for Russia. Um, you know, I if it, it would take a lot of people, it would take a lot of long range strike. Um, it would take a navy, <laughs> which Ukraine doesn't really have a large one of. Uh, it would take a whole range of different capabilities that I don't think the Ukrainians are currently structured for. They're, they're, they're structured for conventional ground operations on flat rolling plains and forests. Um, they're not so well structured for large-scale amphibious operations, whether it's for feints or real landings or for naval operations where you can push back Russian naval capabilities, of which there are many in the Black Sea and, and out of the naval base there. Um, you know, I, I think Crimea at this point in time with current capabilities might well be a bridge too far for Ukraine. All right, then. Uh, we're going to go to Mart, uh, Murat, and then Martin had his hand up earlier sure. and couldn't get on. So uh, go ahead. So just, just i got to go at about 10.15, so about another nine minutes, if that's okay, guys. Absolutely. Thank you, sir, for your time. All right, so let's go. We're going to do a rapid, uh, rapid fire. So let's get M, Martin, CJ, Craig. Go ahead. Well, a quick question, sir. To tie it uh, with the information success the Ukrainians have demonstrated, well, the Russian humiliation is now completely clear to everyone. And how do we walk back from the narrative that they have created, the ideology that they are supporting, the talking points that they keep repeating over and over every night, now that everything is out in the open and they have lost completely lost the information warfare and part of that losing is not only conducting them poorly uh, conducting themselves poorly on the on the battlefield but also the, the amount of uh, utter madness that they have been spouting for the last 70 days um well firstly uh on the cyber side of things i mean the russians haven't been inactive um you know, talking to a couple of sources of mine in the last 24 hours, is they've seen 50 times uh, activity emerging from Russia in the last uh, 76 days or so. So it's not like they haven't been active. Um, and they've certainly been very active in influencing non-Western countries, Africa, South Asia, uh, and other places. Um, so, you know, I think the Russians in that way, there's a continuity of what we've seen previously it's the messages that are very interesting, right? Um, this whole thing about, you know, Nazis, uh, Banderite that Putin uh, mentioned, uh, NATO presenting an existential threat to Russia. Um, and, you know, when the Russian people believe that, that is a very difficult narrative to walk back. I mean, it kind of uh, reinforces um, historical um, beliefs about threats to Mother Russia. I mean, they've seen it. You know, how many people did they lose in the Second World War? 20, 30 million people. That, that has a profound impact on, uh, on a, how a nation sees itself. So Putin's just playing to that. Um, how you walk that back? Boy, uh, you don't walk it back by leaving a, a humiliated nation uh, defeated at the end of this war and making them an international pariah. That just reinforces that narrative. That's why I keep saying there's a really careful balance between defeating a nation and making that defeated nation more dangerous than what they were before, and we've got to try and achieve that balance. And maybe food for thought. I mean, when you have a dictatorial regime that controls the media, they could really switch it and, and spin it any way they want to their own people. Yeah. And they do. Post, yeah. Post-conflict. Post yeah. And they do. Yeah. Right? It's not new to them. No, unfortunately. <laughs> Our, yeah, correct. All right. So, Martin, did Martin, you want to go, or we're just going to go with CJ Martin? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm connecting from Slovakia, uh, and uh, what what's been said is really interesting because this is not only war in the matter of weapons and information, but it is, especially in this part of the world, it's also political. So, what would you suggest? How should we actually deal? 
with the Russian Russian allies that are political players like well Orban may be the first one but half of the parliament in Slovakia is r- right now uh, almost pro Russian almost a half uh we have two nazi parties in the parliament and this situation goes on through many countries so how do you think the western world should deal with these types of allies to prevent a situation like this to go further into Europe later on? No, I think that's a really important question. Um, Because things talked about in parliaments can become reality, as we've seen in the last 76 days. Uh, You know, Belarus, Hungary and some other countries have uh, some influential people with ideas that aren't really aligned with democratic values, freedom of expression, uh, treating all people with dignity and respect, allowing freedom of religion. Um, you know, my sense is the US, notwithstanding its desire to focus in the Indo-Pacific, uh, particularly the Department of State, will be re-looking at different countries in Europe um, and providing incentives for different kinds of candidates. Now, uh, people may say, well, that's, um, you know, trying to change the outcome of votes. Well, maybe, maybe not. But, you know, what do you do when... Um, neo-Nazis get themselves elected to parliament and start pushing for really uh, kind of offensive extraterritorial actions from a country. I mean, it's is that good for European security? So, you know, this goes back to what does the European security architecture look like after this? And the political dimension um, with the kind of issues you just raised has to be part of part of that uh, uh, revised construction of European security. I hope that answers your question there, Martin. I think you dropped. Okay, we're going to go to CJ, then Craig. Yeah, so leading on from that, I just wanted to touch on and ask you a question about deterrence. Uh, I was stationed in Europe for three years and did many exercises that were uh, designated as deterrence missions for Russia. And I had some guys reach out and say, well, sir, I think we failed because Russia invaded. And I tried to explain to them, you know, while Russia did invade, you know, it's contained outside of NATO. So I guess whether it's Taiwan or Ukraine, what does a successful deterrent and deterrent force look like for the democracies of the world? What would you like to see moving forward from this uh, specific war? Yeah, I think it's a great question. It's something that uh, people in our country are struggling with because when you mis- mention the term deterrence, people automatically leap to nuclear weapons, right? It's just this, there's an intellectual leap there for many people and it's not just nuclear weapons. Clearly, they're an important strategic deterrent. And, you know, I think in some respects it has has worked. I mean, we haven't seen a nuclear war, um, thank God. Um, but I think deterrence with conventional capabilities is an understudied endeavour. And, you know, the kind of uh, exercises that were conducted, uh, reforger during the Cold War, were part of NATO and the United States' deterrent posture that didn't involve nuclear weapons the continued deterrent exercise you talked about, I think are really important. You know, this this is a statement of intent to defend NATO countries in order to coerce and deter Russian and other um, adversaries who might seek to uh, be more aggressive. But, you know, I think the theory of deterrence using conventional, using um, uh, influence um, and economic measures uh, is worth... Um, a few thousand more academic papers and, and exploration because, you know, we've seen intelligence, strategic intelligence used for deterrence in this war. You know, how do we incorporate that into a, a deterrence framework moving forward? So, I, you know, I think your point is a really important one. We need to move beyond just n- nuclear capabilities deterrent and how do countries, particularly those who don't have nuclear weapons, deter coercion, deter aggression, against them using um, conventional capabilities and a range of other national activities. Can't just be military, but a range of national activities. Um, I think there's there's a lot more work to be done there. I think it's a really interesting uh, field of endeavour. Awesome. Thank you so much, sir. All right, we're going to go to Alex uh, W. real quick there. I, I know your time is running out, so we'll see Alex and Craig, and then we'll go from there. Uh General Ryan, thanks for your time this morning. No worries. Um, a, a question. 
a question I get asked quite a lot at the moment. Um, for those that don't know, we're in an, in an election cycle, so we have an election going on at the moment. Um, a question that I get asked a lot is, will that election affect Australia's ongoing support for Ukraine and our provision of um, mili what military equipment we can to Ukraine? I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts on that were. Um, not really. Uh, I think the Australian governments, whatever, whoever gets in on the 21st of May, um, will be will have limited agency when it comes to the war in Ukraine or even um, the US-China competition. We'll, we'll provide advice, we'll provide capabilities, but we'll be responding to great world events. And when it comes to Ukraine, we have a policy of supporting them. That's by policy, bipartisan. Um, could we provide more? Absolutely. We've got a heap more Bushmasters and a heap more triple sevens, which I'd love to get rid of and replace with the Korean K9s. Um, so, you know, we could see a step up in aid, but I don't think we'll see any uh, slide back from either party. One, because we're supporting a fellow democracy. And two, uh, supporting uh, Ukraine is probably seen by um, all sides of politics as, as, as good politics at the moment. All right. Uh, what's your timing like there? Yeah, so uh, let's go one more and then uh, I'll need to head off. Okay, Craig, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, and uh, good morning, sir. Uh, appreciate you again taking your time with us. Yeah, no us. worries. Good morning. Um, good morning. Uh, I just want to ask very briefly, we're seeing Ukrainian counterattacks around Kharkiv and some limited counterattacks around Kyrgyzstan and things like mm. that. If you could just very briefly talk about the professionalism and discipline that it takes for a country to execute these things and what it says about the Ukrainian army versus the Russian army. Right. If you could go back to your days in uniform, right, about keeping your officers, you know, well closed up and disciplined. Can you kind of speak to just the, in the general scheme what it means to have a disciplined army and what that looks like versus what it doesn't? Look yeah. Like? Um, yeah. Yeah. Being professional is pretty important, actually. And the Russians have proven that, um, you know, being on the defense, you know, whether it's tactically or operationally, um, as the Ukrainians were initially, is very different to then shifting to more offensive activities. You know, I think uh, most of the counterattacks we saw north of Kiev is, is more um, tactical offensive activities to support a operationally defensive scheme of manoeuvre. I think what we're seeing in Kherson and Kharkiv in particular is different to that. I think we're seeing the Ukrainians shift, at least in some parts at the operational level, to the offensive. Um, and as you're probably all aware, you know, that takes a different mindset. It takes an aggressive mindset. It takes a tighter coordination of combined arms. It takes much better logistics so you don't outrun them. Um, but it also takes really good discipline to make sure that, you know, if you're given a limit of exploitation, you don't go beyond that because uh, tactically it might be good, but operationally, strategically it might be stupid, as in don't exploit into Russia. That would be a really good idea if you're a Ukrainian leader. Um, so, you know, I, I think the professional discipline here is around um, logistics planning, around the mindset and leadership of shifting from defensive to offensive operations and understanding the bigger picture. You know, you might be a tactical unit on the offensive, but don't do something that's going to make the president's life harder. <laughs> you know, do things that make your president's life easier. Um, and I know that's hard for soldiers sometimes in the heat of the moment, but that's what good leaders are supposed to do, always see the bigger picture. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you for your time, uh, General. I just wanted to let everyone know that General McRyan, Major General McRyan from the Australian Army, uh, has come into our state several times and he's uh, given us uh, a great insight into uh, geopolitical uh, and military matters pertaining currently to the conflict, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. He's a strategist, a leader, and an author. And uh, if you want to check his Twitter handle out, uh, please do. It's War in the Future. Um, and uh, he is uh, always welcome on our show. If you could please uh, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Check out his books. I really appreciate your time, General. And thank you for being a part of this uh, information campaign. We are here at Maria Aid, and we're trying to help increase the general public's access to knowledge about accurate information yeah. about Ukraine and follow it up with expert and uh, 
diligent analysis by gentlemen and gentlewomen, uh, like as everyone who's coming here and yourself in particular. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, no worries. And um, you know, thanks to you and, and the whole team, um, Walter and Axel, um, you know, John, Jason, and everyone else who joins regularly. It's, it's a real pleasure. And I'll, I know I'll be back. Thank you, sir. Thank you so thank you. much. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.